so welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to be talking about optimizing test cases, uh, making them run faster and in parallel. Uh, kind of a quick overview of the tips that you should follow uh, to get that over the goal line. Uh, you can access the slides at any time by following that URL. Uh, it's a bit.ly slash fast tests. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Santiago Suarez Ordonez. Uh, I'm a Selenium committer, contributor. Um, I'm Sauce Ninja at Sauce Labs, which is basically a Selenium expert support, however you want to call it. I've been working with Selenium and test automation for five years, maybe more. I'm not completely sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at SantiYCR or find me on my email, sso at saucelabs.com. Here's what we will cover. Um, we're going to be talking about ensuring data independence, uh, first of all, for sure. Uh, making your test more atomic and focusing essentials. Um, generating application state, one of my favorite tips that not too many people follow. I think that's super important if you want to have a test suite optimized for performance. Um, and not for performance testing, but for running fast, for getting builds uh, sooner. Um, using guinea pigs which is what we call pages where we embed uh, widgets just for the sake of testing them. Uh, removing third party from applications, getting rid of static pauses, of course, uh, splitting your builds and, and paying a little bit more attention. So first of all, uh, data independence. Um, data independence is rule number one if you want to optimize your build and make it faster. Uh, data independence means that your tests depend on the execution order. If right now, if you can't run your tests in a separate order, if you can just rename them all and have your test suite trigger them in a different order and everything fails, that means that there's data, uh, data dependence in your, in your suite. Uh, that means that you need your login test to run before your change password test because you're just using the same session in the browser uh, or your del delete account. If you're using the same information in, in different tests, uh, that means that they will collide with each other, and that's rule number one for being able to run them all in parallel. Uh, there's different tricks for doing this, different tricks for being able to use um, independent data from different tests. Uh, people get, depending on, of course, the company, you can get access to the database and just inject uh, stuff in the DB every time you're going to use the test. That's the way at SAUCE we do it. We basically have all our models available. <coughs> Excuse me available from testing uh, in the same way we have them from production code. So we can create accounts uh, in a millisecond without having to go through the whole workflow of creating an account uh, from the UI. Um, you can also put hooks in your application and make REST API calls for it. Uh, the fundamental part is that every time you're going to do something with an account, uh, with an item, whatever you use as a unit of uh, information in your application, you create it right away. It needs to be brand new and nothing else needs to touch it. That's the only way you'll be able to run all your tests in parallel. Mm -hmm. And of course, wipe your build, every, uh, your database every time you finish a build. That means that you're not going to be relying on data that was there before. Uh, you can also mock it before. That's another trick you can do. Uh, create a set of data that you want to be able be, to be available before the test run. So you just mock the whole data before the build runs and then start pulling out of that list of users. You just got to be really smart that you're not reusing that more than once. Because uh, otherwise you're going to start getting these flaky failures where uh, things pass sometimes and fail sometimes. It's just because you're being unlucky and the, later, the data is, be, is colliding while it's just are using that. And you definitely don't want uh, flaky builds and results that don't reflect reality because that's the first thing that makes you lose faith in your build and that makes your test completely useless. Uh, second of all, that's something, this is something I see a lot and I think we got to focus more on. It's making tests more atomic, making tests focus on the essential. I think we, I mean, I carry this from when I did manual testing in the past. I started as a manual tester and, and the goal there is to get the most stuff done in the shortest amount of time. So you would probably cram a whole workflow and try to do the longest thread of uh, steps in your application to test the most amount of things. So you're really smart optimizing what I put after this, 
So I'm first going to log in, and then going to change my password. I'm then going to, I don't know, update my email. The whole workflow you can before you close and start over. <clears throat> With Selenium, this is not really important. You shouldn't be optimizing for this. You should be optimizing for breaking your tests in pieces and being able to run them in parallel. Here you have, you're able to horizontally scale, and that's the way you should go. So with tests, I would be like, test the sign up, login, change password, and log out. That is, that is definitely not a good idea. You want to test for login, create a test for login. You want to test the sign up, create a test only for sign up. Um, no, testing, <clears throat> no testing for content, no testing for performance. Those should be separate tests. If you want to test the title of the page, you test it in a specific test that's going to be about that and probably all the content. When you want to test functionality, you don't want failures connected to the web server taking 30 seconds longer or not. Uh, you got to focus on what you're willing to test right now. That will give you more precise uh, failure reports and definitely a, a better return on investment when you run in parallel. Um, well, this is pretty much just kind of an extension of what I was saying. Uh, try not to focus on testing content as you go along. You're testing functionality, so you want to focus on the functionality that you're testing. If you're testing for a login, just get there, type username, password, submit, and ensure that you're, you're in the account page. Don't write a test that in the middle is going to check for a couple of words that need to be in the login, the title of the page. All that stuff is slowing you down, and it's going to give you failures when you don't really care about that. You're caring about the login. You definitely need to have tests for content if you want to. And probably Selenium is not the right tool for that. Uh, Selenium is made for testing JavaScript intensive applications and UIs. If you want to test for content in a page, you just simulate HTTP, get the whole HTML, and parse it as much as you want. It's going to take you way less time than using a whole browser for that. Um, and again, it's going to be less flaky. Selenium is a big stack. You're doing browser testing. There's a lot of things behind that, from the whole browser JavaScript engine to the memory of the OS, to the whole OS state. Uh, using browser for content is not a good idea, or for performance, depending on what you're testing, of course. This is not uh, black and white, but kind of the guidelines. Generating application states, uh, it's a very interesting one. Um, this is kind of fundamental for optimizing tests, reducing, in the, uh, reducing dependence between different parts of the application and functionalities. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, let's use the example of a shopping cart. Uh, if you have to test a shopping cart and you're about to test a checkout, uh, what you would guess is, well, I first need to have an account. So maybe I'm going to run a test for creating an account. I'm going to go through the workflow of creating an account. Then I'm going to need to be logged in. So I'm going to have to log in in the same workflow. Then I'm going to have to add items to my card. So then you have to go and search for items, add them to the shopping cart. And you probably spend over a minute in this whole workflow until you get to the checkout, which is actually the important part, the part that you care about, the part that you actually want to test. Supposedly, all the steps before until then already have their own tests and already told you that they're passing. So you don't really need to care whether that happened or not. So the way you overcome this is by being able to generate application states right from your test without having to go through all the UI steps. You're basically generating data. You, you don't need to do it through the UI. The UI is probably the less efficient place to do that kind of thing. Um, and again, there's multiple ways to do this. Uh, you can inject stuff in the database, get a session, and then inject a cookie in the browser, and then your browser will be magically in the spot that you want it to. Um, there's an easy way. It really depends on your company and on the rules that you guys set for yourselves. Um, you can basically just open a magic URL. Of course, this will only be available in testing and development. You don't want to put this in production because security is zero. Uh, you basically just see the URL that will provide you, you just put a username in the URL and will give you a super plain HTML, no loading times, and it will create all the cookies that you need so that you're there. Um, let me see if I can do a demo of that one. <coughs> oh, damn. I think I opened it. 
So standard login would be go to my application login. This is all Selenium doing it. Get to the username, get to the password, type my user. Uh, this whole process hitting login probably not going to work because that account doesn't even exist. This whole process takes 10 seconds to the browser and it's subject to failures. If my login fails, let's say that I broke my login and I couldn't log in, now I'm not going to be able to test the checkout of the shopping cart that I was expecting to check. And that doesn't mean that the checkout is broken, so I don't really want to see that the checkout test is broken when the login is broken. That just means that the login is broken and I should have a test for that and it's going to tell me about it. Uh, a way better way to do it is just open this magic URL, you can place it for development, and as you can see, the loading times are going to be super fast, and I'm instantly going to be logged in. No passwords, no interactions with the browser. We don't care about that stuff right now. We're just generating application states in my browser. So all I would need to do is probably add a login and then add items to the card in a similar way. So I would just add item and then the item ID, and that would be basically it. So in less than three seconds in your browser you can have as many items as you want you'll be logged in and then you can focus on the essential which is checking out on your test uh, I have like 25 windows here So generating application data, uh, states is not only going to make your suite faster, but it's going to make your reports more detailed and more uh, reflect the reality better. If your login breaks, you don't want to know it in your checkout test. You want your checkout test to tell you the checkout functionality actually works or not. And the best way we found for this is generally generating the application state through the UI. Of course, this requires development on the server side. Um, there's different tricks for it. Maybe there's rules that will not allow you to do this, but uh, it's definitely worth uh, considering. Uh, and of course, keep manual versions of your page of your models uh, or of the functionality so that you would have a manual login that would actually open the login page, type username and password, and whenever you actually need to do that for functionality reasons, um, you can do it. Next tip, uh, using guinea pigs. So guinea pigs is what we call to pages that are made solely for the purpose of hosting a widget. Uh, there's a lot of places, again, we're optimizing for functionality testing. So a lot of times that you, you want to test a WYSIWYG, uh, an editor that uh, one of those what you see, what you get editors, fully uh, JavaScript intensive all over the place. Um, and you want to write a Selenium test for it. But let's say that your, your widget is maybe 10 steps in your application. You have to first log in, you have to first add an item to the card. Uh, again, the, ha the whole workflow, and maybe there's stuff that you just can't really generate through application states. So you're adding 40 seconds on runtime to your test before you can even reach the spot where you actually want to test. Uh, the way we've overcome this is basically just putting a test page with the widget in it. Not, not having to worry about the actual functionality of the website, but only the widget. And there we just hit it hundreds of times with different tests that focus on different parts of the widget. Uh, we just test it really extensively there. And then when we place it in different pages, we just run a basic set of smoke tests that get to that page and ensure that the widget is there and maybe that the basic functionality works. Um, again, this is debatable. You're not really testing it intensively in the place that you're placing it. Uh, but every, every, uh, every team has their priorities. Uh, so you can choose whether you want to focus on uh, performance and getting your build running in four minutes instead of 45 or, or, or deeply testing. And there's different layers of gray between one edge and the other. Uh, but this is definitely a, a good tip if you guys are not doing it already. Um, <clears throat> another one I think uh, it's very important uh, 
at SAUCE, we've been working in our own build for a while. We evolve as absolutely everyone does, uh, creating a bunch of tests, uh, letting those run out of control, and making your build fail one out of three times, and being all pissed about our tests and how flaky they are, or our functionality and how flaky it is. And we've started, started optimizing it and fighting what the problems were um, to first get the build done sooner and, and second make sure that every time it said it was blue, it was blue and every time it was red, it was actually red. Uh, we're still working on that part, but uh, we've gotten uh, pretty far along with all this stuff. Um, removing third party was essential for being able to control a build. And by third party, I mean all those scripts that people inject in web pages for things like collecting feedback, uh, analyzing uh, user, uh, analyzing usage, Google Analytics, uh, figuring out where users are, where they're going, which page they're looking at. Uh, there's uncountable amounts of widgets that you can now insert in your application. All those are JavaScript files that are going to be loading from an external server, and you don't have control over that external server. So it's all load time that is going to add <coughs> to absolutely every page that Selenium goes through. Um, and a lot of times it will fail. And I'm sure that it fails in production as well for real users. But we're lucky that real users in general uh, are able to either wait more or don't really care whether the page has completely loaded. They just care whether uh, the UI that they're looking for is ready and they just keep interacting. Um, so Lenium is not that smart. So Lenium will wait for a full page load, and if the page didn't load, will fail right away. Um, it's not going to be uh, refreshing and checking out unless you tell it to. So <clears throat> removing third-party widgets is definitely going to give you more control over how your tests uh, how your tests run and how your application responds. Um, you're definitely going to need. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> a couple of tests that actually go through the uh, through the pages with the widgets, of course. You don't want to not test them at all and then deploy to production and figure out that um, these widgets are now causing some kind of in <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> some kind of interaction that you're not you're not testing at all. That would definitely be bad news. Um, but I would say for 99% of your tests, uh, where you're focusing on functionality and you need Selenium to be efficient. Just get rid of those widgets and, and then focus tests on integration testing, third-party testing, or however you're going to call it. And those are going to be slower, but are going to be less tests. Well, this one's kind of obvious, but uh, I still keep seeing static pauses in, in users' tests when they report uh, bugs in Sauce Labs, saying that our execution fails or that things pass locally and fail uh, in the cloud. It's generally because there's some kind of static pause in the test. And static pauses are terrible. I'm going to tell you why right now if you don't know already. Um, they can basically either fall short or fall long. And in both cases, it's really bad. Uh, static pauses falling short. Uh, sorry. Let me recap. And let's say, let's, let's put an example in, in which you would actually put a static pause. Uh, you create a Selenium test. You either record it with Selenium IDE or you actually write it yourself. Uh, in which you want to, again, log in, interact with the UI, open the page, try to type in two, in two fields, uh, submit the form, and keep on going. When you run it manually or, or record it, it all goes great. Now, the third time you run it, it fails, and you're not completely sure why. And after running it 12 times, you figure out that the widgets that you're trying to interact with are actually not available in the page at the time Selenium tries to run. So anyway, it's way faster than a human being. So it's going to try to interact with the elements right away in a millisecond. And if the page is loading those elements via Ajax, uh, there's networking going on. Uh, it's not going to be there a lot of times, either for bandwidth reasons. Uh, maybe the web server is under a lot of uh, usage. Um, the thing is that at that point, your best trick is saying, well, I'm just going to make it wait five seconds. And then the widget is going to be there the 10 times that you run, and it passes. And then everything's great. You just commit your test and move on. Bad news is that that is soon going to change. And you just cause flaky, uh, flaky results. Because maybe when you put this in the build, uh, the web server is going to be hit by 40 Selenium instances at the same time, or, or 300. 
Um, that's all going to be causing load on the web server. It's going to take a lot longer to reply uh, to any of these things. So now your five second wait is sometimes going to fall short, sometimes not. And you're going to be seeing blue and red and you don't really know what that is. And you just, your only answer is just rerun the test and next time it's going to pass. And that's terrible for, for your test. It's going to just take any kind of belief on the usefulness of it out of the picture. Um, so when they fall short, it's bad news. You're going to get a failure that doesn't represent what the functionality is. Now what happens when they fall long? You just added a five second wait, but maybe when the web server replies in one, why do you really want to wait for extra seconds uh, for, for something that has already happened? Uh, if you guys have a process in which you can't push until the build is blue, you're just wasting your time and you're wasting absolutely everyone's time wait, uh, waiting for these four seconds that are completely uh, unnecessary. Um, so the right way to do pausing and waiting, um, and believe me, I, I definitely add a lot of static pauses when I debug tests. When things fail, my first step is definitely adding pauses here and there to figure out where the timing issue is. But as soon as I, my test pass again and I figure out what the timing issue is, now I, I, I sit on it and think, well, what's the right thing to wait for here? What, why is it static wait, uh, waiting for? And then you just create a smart assertion being like, all right, it's waiting for this element to become present. So you just add an iteration or add an implicit wait or an explicit wait saying, don't move on until this element is there. And put it enough timeout. Don't, don't give it a 10 second timeout because it's not really you're not really testing for performance here. You're testing for functionality. So if you gotta give it 90 seconds for it to load, it's gonna be way better for the test to take 80 seconds and pass than for the test to take 10 seconds and fail one time out of 10. You're focusing again in functionality. When you wanna test for performance, when you really care on the time that things take to load, you're gonna put a control scenario, you're gonna run a control amount of browsers to hit your, your site or simulate a, a control amount of browsers and then you can test for performance. Functionality is one thing, testing for performance is another one. Um, and if all these steps still don't work, if you have a set of tests that mock the DB too much, uh, need to wipe it every once in a while, you're still not going to be able to run them in parallel. There's a lot of there's, there's a lot of reasons for which this could happen. Uh, it happened a lot in Sauce Labs. We, I, would, I, I think at this point we have something like 2,000 tests, uh, out of which 500 or 600 are unit tests, and a lot of those unit tests can really run in parallel um, for different reasons, like wiping the database or, or mocking a lot of stuff internally. Um, the way we handle this is by splitting our build in different steps. In one step, we run all the tests that can't really run in parallel, uh, the serial step, and then we have another step where we run all the tests in parallel, uh, the ones that can, so that we optimize that last chunk. So again, having tests that can't run in parallel doesn't mean that you can't run your whole build, you, that you have to run your whole build serially. That's just a waste of time. If you have tests that can run in parallel, even if it's 10, you're going to be optimizing time by putting those 10 in a small chunk at the end that all run together. Uh, and it's also a great way to make the transition over. So you start just placing the, the secondary step where you run stuff in parallel. Maybe you can tag the tests that can run in parallel and you tag the ones that can run serially and that's the way you split them. It really depends on the programming language that you're using and the framework that you use. Um, but that's a great next step. The, the first step to everything is just making, a way, uh, making a, an environment in which I can run tests in parallel. Even if you have one, or if you have two, or if you don't have any at all, you just do that and then start moving them over and seeing how they behave. And you can move them back and forth if you don't have time to focus on that right now. Just move them all to serial again. And when you have time next week, you can go back, move them to the parallel side and start debugging why things are, are, are not working correctly. Um, and the next, the next tip that I have, it's, it's, yeah, it's basically just sit in your bill, check out what's going on, uh, and start optimizing from there. It's kind of ridiculous the amount of thing that you can figure out by just looking how things happen. 
a lot of people, I mean, most of us just push and, and expect for the results. And all our debug loop is just waiting for the bill. It takes 45 minutes. Then I'm going to make some changes, push again, check back in 45 minutes, see if I optimize stuff or not. While you actually have everything going on right there, you can just go to your task grid. You can go to source labs. You can go to your build log and analyze absolutely every test result and investigate what's taking longer, what not. You can check the durations of every session. You can report that in the log so that you can start seeing, okay, this test is the cost of 10% of my whole build. So I definitely want to optimize that one. And it's going to be the, the best ROI that you have. Um, even if it takes a couple of hours, it's definitely worth doing probably every two weeks or three weeks. Uh, if it takes 10 minutes, maybe do it every day. I don't know. It's up to you. But uh, every minute that you spend there is probably going to save you minutes later while the bills run and while you're making everyone wait for stuff to happen. I don't know if we have time for q &A. I think we are, we're here for 10 more minutes. I went really quickly because I thought we didn't have enough time. Uh, if you guys have any questions, now's the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what you're talking about is what I suggest. Uh, um, so the question was, you're talking about static waiting. Does that sometimes represent when I wait, uh, when I iterate and wait for a condition to be met? That's what I call dynamic waits, and that's what I recommend. Uh, instead of a 10-second wait, without really knowing what's going on, but just saying, wait 10 seconds, something's going to happen, and my test is going to pass 99% of the times you create a dynamic wait. That's going to be way longer timeout. Again, 60 seconds. Consider 90 or consider 120. You don't really care about that part. What you really care is that if the test passes, it represents the functionality is working correctly. Under load or under low bandwidth conditions or whatever uh, could be happening. Uh, but dynamic waits is definitely the way to go. Check for some, f check for some condition to be met wait for a split second or, or one second, check again, and keep iterating. If the reason, uh, if the condition is met in four seconds, your test will move on instantly, and you will be optimizing a lot of time. And if your test, uh, if, if the condition test uh, takes 60 seconds uh, for random uh, reasons, um, you will still get the green, because you're caring about the functionality. And if the functionality still passes, even though slow, um, your results are going to be fine. Mm -hmm. But what that's going to have involved with, because you're going to now explode your tests a lot more, you're going to have a lot more, you know, um, database manipulation. Interactions. Stuff like that. Yeah. That alone would probably add, A, some time, more time than you were using before, and could have its own flakiness. How do you deal with that? Well, I don't think it would add more. Uh, sorry, the question was, uh, now that you're starting to interact with the database a lot more, injecting data here and there, uh, you're going to be adding a lot of e extra time and a lot of interactions with the database, and that could cause flakiness and, and extra time as well. Um, so I don't think it would cost additional time. I think the UI is a less efficient way to interact with the database, but you're still creating the same amount of data, right? Mm -hmm. If I want a new account, uh, if I do it through the UI, I'm going to create the account. It's going to cause the same e database interactions by going through the whole UI. You're just adding the inefficiency of a whole browser filling out forms, which is definitely not what you need. Um, so I don't worry about timing. Flakiness is definitely an interesting uh, thing to consider. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it's a constant battle. You got to really focus on, on, on figuring out what's going on. I think the, fa uh, I think the split in the building two parts, a uh, serial and a parallel part, where you can move stuff back and forth and figure out what's going on in each. And, and when you have other stuff to focus on, you can just move everything back and go back to your stuff. Uh, it's a good way to tackle that. Um, but yeah, it, it really depends on how you interact with the database. You can even put, again, REST API calls and have your developers handle the database completely and tell them, 
you just give me a REST API that I can use for creating accounts. All I need to do is just give you a username and a password and you just tell me okay or, or, or not. And they will be able to optimize all the interactions as much as possible. That, that's another option for sure. And just to follow up on that, on the, uh, sorry, but if you have tests test running in parallel, hitting the same system with those database changes going on, one database thing could affect the other if they're all running in parallel. Yeah. Uh, well, I would definitely encourage you to only do database interaction when you're creating new data. Um, yeah, you could also modify data, but again, well, the way we, we make sure that doesn't happen is we basically add a random, uh, we just randomize a lot of the, of the content of this data. So every time we create an account, it's going to have a username like testing one, two, three, four, five, and those five numbers are going to be completely randomized. And if, it's, if they collide one time out of 5,000 times, well, you just make it seven times and it's never going to collide. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that all the data is independent from each other and you're not going to be touching. Uh, they're not going to be touching itself at any point uh, in time. Because, again, yeah, there's definitely flakiness, and flakiness is the worst thing you can do. Uh, regarding... Uh, causing flakiness because of too many interactions with the DB. You definitely wouldn't worry about that part. I, I don't know if you if you thought about that part, but I would definitely don't worry about interacting with the DB. That's what they're made for. Yeah. DB now they, databases are made are made for handling thousands of interactions at a time for real, from real users. So yeah if your test DB can't handle it, that's this definitely a possibility. <laughs> Just get a better specs in your server, or, or, or get your dev guys to to reproduce production a little bit more, and, and it should be good. I was thinking maybe more creating, like you have a serial and parallel suite. Maybe you have several parallel suites. You know, right, you have hitting suites stuff a lot. You know that that pack doesn't interact with each other's data, and then maybe Interesting. Other yeah. Well, yeah. Our suite definitely creates. I, I mean, all the data that a whole uh, build run creates is definitely never going to be the same that the second repetition of that build. We have definitely uh, randomizations all over the place to make sure. And yeah, well, when you start discussing that you're DDoSing your own DB or your own test server, that's, that's not your, I mean, it's not part of the, the what you should care when you write functional tests. You should be, someone should focus on make your test servers better or give you two test servers so that you can focus on both at the same time. It's, it's, there's different approach to that for sure. But that's a good problem to have. That means that you're running tests faster and, and, you, and you're doing the right job. When you, when you say use um, sort of behind the scenes tricks to generate data and things like that, have you got any particular, because what, one of the problems is, well, how are you making sure that what you're doing in your behind the scenes trick is what would happen if you perform the same operation through the UI. <coughs> and typically developers make sure that the bit that around the front works, but how do yeah. you make sure that yeah, what that's you're doing isn't then introducing problems because you forgot to set off that crucial bit of the user or whatever. That's uh that's an interesting way of thinking for sure. Um and it goes kinda goes back to the same thinking of well Tests are code. How do you test the code of your test? You eventually, if you think about it, you actually need to test your tests as well because they're code. Any bit of code of the use needs to be tested. Uh, at which point you stop because when you write tests for your test, you're going to have to test the test of your test, and, and that gets tricky. Um, the way well, the way we interact with a database is actually through models. Uh, we model the user and we do user dot create. Uh, and we are pretty confident about those models because we have unit tests that test those. But again, there's no 100% coverage. You're never going to reach that coverage because your test could be broken. And we've, we've found situations in which we're not injecting the right data into the V and we're making the test pass when you run it through production and, and maybe the behavior is differently. Another possibility is that you create a staging server and make your build behave different, uh, make your tests behave differently when they run on staging. And uh, maybe when they run on staging, the login function that is going to go through the special application state generation part uh, are now going to be, go directly through the UI. And maybe you don't care about the performance of staging because the one that's actually blocking your developers is dev. 
Uh, so that's another option that will give you, will give you more solid coverage and, and in, in a spot that is not that expensive to sacrifice performance. Um, that's another option I would definitely consider. We're, we're, at SOS, we're not big enough. I, I mean, we don't have enough developers to worry about um, another staging environment if we need to run the build again or, or if we feel that things are not flaky, we just turn on the flip and make them go through the manual workflow instead of through the... It really depends on how much time you want to spend coding your tests and, and which your priorities are. Um, so kind of browser failures are, are really tricky. Um, in a lot of situations, they can be a result of a Selenium bug. In other situations, it can be a result of a browser bug, um, even in different OSs. Something, uh, in this particular case, it was Firefox. I mean, test passing well in IE, I think. Test passing well in one browser, failing in Firefox in, uh, in Windows, and or passing in Firefox in Mac, and then failing in, in a different machine. Um, it's not really related with this topic, but I would advise you to check into native interactions, uh, native events versus synthesized events. So learning behaves differently depending on the OS that it is. It falls back on Mac. It falls back to synthesized events with JavaScript triggering events. Um, versus actual OS interactions like scrolling and clicking. And I've seen uh, really uh, confusing stuff there. So you may want to check that out. All right. Thank you very much.